Welcome everyone. My name is Victor Monga. It is February 7th, 2020. We are recording from California, USA. Today we are going to talk about API security. I'm going to introduce virtually testing a little bit about uh, this series and then I'm going to hand it off to Ina, who's our today's speaker. He's going to talk about APIs. About virtual testing. So we are a California based nonprofit organization. We are also tax exempt. What that means is any donations given to us is uh, tax deductible. Our organization is structured in three different categories, education, fiscal sponsorship, and r and I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more. Our focus is about cybersecurity education. We also provide mentorship and also internship programs. Let's talk about it. So this session is actually under VT education, which is focused on providing cybersecurity education and mentorship and also internship. Our second branch, which is VT Wings, it's just a name. Um, primarily it focuses on fiscal sponsorship. For those who doesn't know about fiscal sponsorship, what that means is if you have a community who would like to be a nonprofit and shares the same vision like us, we can help them. We can help them secure donations. We can also provide some platforms for them to start their organization. And the last is VT Titans. That is our R&D branch who work with our cutting edge industry leading organizations to test their platforms. All of this session is gonna be recorded and also all the slide deck will be uploaded on our social media platforms. If you would like to get the hold of this content, please follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, or YouTube. The links are pretty straightforward, linkedin.virtualtesting.com, twitter.virtualtesting.com, or youtube.virtualtesting.com. We have talked to Inan about our API security and he graciously has agreed to start this API security learning series with virtual testing. Inan is OWASP project leader and also known entity in cybersecurity community. So I'm blessed to have him here today on our webinar. This series will contain webinars, which is more like introductory then we will also talk about uh, a little bit of advanced API security in different webinars and web conferences. And then in fall, we will consider having a hands-on training on API security. Today's topic, API versus IPA, as I was saying, let's start with API security and we'll lead the session to IPA. With that, I'm gonna hand it off to Inan. Thank you so much, Victor. And I want to say it's my pleasure to be here and to be part of uh, virtual testing. I think uh, that you guys doing an amazing job. It's not very easy to find resources in the field of uh, security and security education, especially in the field of application security. And I think it's uh, very important to have these type of organizations, especially nonprofit organizations that uh, kind of, I'm not trying to sell you anything, that just want to educate the market. Uh, I really believe in the mission of this organization. So the agenda for today is to talk about uh, API security and APIs. I just want to make sure that you are on the same page with the audience. It's not gonna be a deep dive into API security. It's more like to build the infrastructure to talk about the OSP top 10 for APIs. Uh, we are gonna talk about what are APIs in general, because many people talk about APIs. Some people don't necessarily understand what exactly are APIs. Uh, we are going to talk. About, we're going to see examples for uh, real API breaches from the recent uh, from recent time, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the OWASP top ten for APIs. I'm not going to talk about each one of them, just to introduce you to a few of them, and then in the next uh, webinar we are going to uh, deep deep dive into the OWASP top ten for APIs and to uh, to talk about each one of them with, with more details. So let's talk about the first issue, about the first topic. What are APIs? Many people talk about APIs, it became kind of a, a buzzword in the last years. Um, and there are many different ways to define APIs. The thing about APIs, it's a very abstracted concept. 
And the way that I like to describe APIs, APIs is basically a tool to expose data or function from one component so it can be used by other components. Uh, I know it's kind of a very high level abstracted uh, explanation, but it's only because APIs are kind of abstracted. Um, let's, let's start with some example from the real world. Um, so let's imagine that you are a founder of a cybersecurity company and you live in Palo Alto. Uh, there are many founders of cybersecurity companies in Palo Alto, but you got lucky and you managed to sell your company for uh, billions of dollars. And then one day you got rich. So what you do, the next step is you, you want to buy a house in Palo Alto. It makes sense, you want to live in Palo Alto, you want to raise your kid in Palo Alto, so you're looking for a new, for a new property. What you do is you go to the rental agency in Palo Alto, and you look at a few different options, you, you found some, uh, some specific apartment that looks very nice to you. Uh, and you want to, to ask a question. You, you want to, to, uh, to know what is the price of this specific property. What you do is you go to the rental agency and you ask the agent, hey, what is the price of the house on Middlesbrough Road? Middlesbrough Road, by the way, it's a beautiful street in Palo Alto. And then the agent tells you, oh, we actually got a, a really good price today. It's only for you, it's only $5 billion. Uh, this is a very basic type of communication. You ask a question and the agent has answers with some like uh, output. In this case, the output is the price of the property. Um, so you say to yourself, okay, it's a very good price, uh, but, but you're a very smart consumer. So you don't buy it right away. You try to go to the rental agency for about a few weeks and every day you ask the same question. You come back and you ask, hey, what is the price of the property? And you get the same answer every day. After a few weeks, the rental agency uh, kind of thinks about it and says to themselves, it's not the best way of communication. You spend time coming to the rental agency and we pay money for the agent to tell you what is the price we can convert this type of communication to API communication. So what they do is basically expose an API. What the API does, it replaces in some way the, the agent and it tells you the price of the house. And uh, they build, they, in, in order for you as a, as a user to communicate with the API, you need to use the mobile client. In this case, it's just a, an iOS app, an app for iPhone. And you install the app, and then you start looking at different properties in Palo Alto. You find the property that you like, and you want to know the price. So instead of talking with the agent, you can just use the API in order to get this type of information. In this case, the type of information that we are talking about is the specific uh, price of the specific house. And today, what happens, there are many standards how to implement this type of communication. There are many ways to, to ask questions and there are many ways to, uh, like, to, like, to write responses. So if we talk about APIs today, we usually talk about REST APIs. This is the modern standard of how to implement APIs. And I want to talk about a few things when it comes to REST APIs. So first of all, um, you can see that your mobile client, after you click on the button, after you choose a specific property, behind the scenes, your mobile application communicates with the API. Every time you use a mobile client, it doesn't matter if we talk about uh, Uber, about Facebook, every time you use a mobile client, behind the scenes, there are many calls to the API in order to fetch data and show it to the user. So after you choose the specific property, which is the property that you already saw, which is the house on middle speed road, this property has a representation on the API. In this case, the representation is 717, 717. This is the ID of the property. So in this case, the communication between the client to the API, it's called the API call. Um, and you can see a few different com components. The first component is the HTTP method. In this case, it's GET. GET is an HTTP method, like in general, HTTP method tells the server what type of action you want to perform. In case of get, HTTP method is just to fetch data, just to get data. After that, you can see the URL or the URI of the API. 
This is the API endpoint. This is the specific function that you want to access. In this case, the function is slash houses, slash 717, slash price. This is the name of the endpoint. If you combine the HTTP method and the URL, you get the endpoint of the, the, the API endpoint. And one last thing is in, about the, the API call is resources. Resources in, re, in REST is also a very abstracted idea. Uh, and the way that I would describe it, you can think about the resource as like a piece of data. In this case, the piece of data correlates to, to a house. Now let's talk about the response from the API. The response from the API, um, basically the information that the API needs to represent is the price of the house. And the price is $5 billion. The way that REST APIs do it is using JSONs. So you can, say, you can see the price, the price, which is the name, the key name, and then you can see the key value which is 5 billion. And this is basically how mobile applications communicate with companies today. And not only mobile applications, we are gonna talk about it, but every communication today between client and servers, most of the types of communication is done using API. The same way that the rental agency exposed a, a function to get the price of a specific house, they could expose other endpoints because they already have the, the APIs. So I just wanted to define something new, I'd like to talk about the new definition, which is what is the difference between APIs and APIs endpoints. In this case, the API is the API of the rental agency, and every API exposes many different endpoints. As we talked about it, the endpoint is a combination of the HTTP method and the URL. The same way you could expose, they expose the get price endpoint, they can expose other endpoints, for example, uh, the endpoint of contact us. So if you, if you have some complaint or if you want to contact a specific agent using the app, you are gonna use the feature on the mobile app itself of sending, an, of sending a form, a specific form, and you can uh, write text and your name. And after you click submit, uh, the mobile client gonna trigger an API call to the contact us endpoint. Uh, they, the same way they, they can expose an endpoint to buy a new house. So you can do the, the transaction online. Let's talk about HTTP methods. HTTP methods is something that is used in uh, APIs because if you think about it, HTTP is one layer and above HTTP you, you got the uh, REST layer. So it's some type of abstraction on top of HTTP. So REST APIs, use HTTP methods in order to describe uh, what is the action that the client wants to perform. There are four main types of HTTP methods uh, that I wanna talk about. The first one is get, as we talk, already talked about it, is just to get something, some piece of information. And then you got put, which is to update uh, a piece of information. Sometimes some applications use a patch instead of put. And there is post, is to create a piece of information, and there is delete, to delete a piece of information. And again, the reason I talk uh, in a very abstracted language, which is like piece of information, what is a piece of information? It can be anything. If we talk about ride sharing apps, it can be a trip, it can be a user, it can be a receipt. Everything in the rest, uh, in, a in the API world is a resource. And there is no one strict definition one is what is the resource. Uh, developers might define it a bit different what, what does it mean uh, an API resource. And that's the reason I keep it like as a piece of information. You can think about it as a piece of information. So for example, if I want to delete, if there is one endpoint to delete uh, a receipt, or let's say that you have an admin uh, on the Uber API, let's say Uber have many admins to manage all the clients of Uber and uh, there is a management console and they want to delete a specific user or a specific rider, the API call behind the scenes between the admin console to the API would be a delete HTTP method. This is just a very uh, convenient way to describe what you want to do. So API is basically a bunch of methods and, and definitions, how to define communication between client and servers. It's pretty simple, right? 
I want to talk a little bit about different types of APIs. You got B2B APIs, which is business to business, B2C APIs, which is business to client, and internal APIs. Let's talk about the three main, three main types of APIs. The first one is B2B APIs. So we talked about the rental agency in Palo Alto. Let's say that they found another rental agency in San Francisco, and they want to share details between them. Uh, they want to share details in order to, to collaborate and to, to, make, uh, to make more money. Uh, one, of the, one of the type of information they want to share between them is the emails of the richest customers that they have. Uh, why? Because then they can target these specific people and to send them specific uh, ads on email. But in this case, you don't really want your clients, you don't want your mobile clients to be able to access this endpoint that exposes the emails of your internal clients. Uh, it would be a huge violation of, PI, of uh, PII and many other things. So what they do, they expose a B2B API only to their partners. So B2B is business to business. In this case, one business is the San Francisco rental agency and the, the other business is the Palo Alto rental agency. And this way, the San Francisco rental agency can communicate with the Palo Alto rental agency using the B2B APIs in order to get the emails of the richest people in Palo Alto uh, and their emails. So they can send them like uh, very, very annoying emails. Another example, I'm not sure if you heard about it, but recently Disney bought Hulu, uh, which is a company that allows you to, to see videos, like to see TV shows and movies. So let's say that Disney doesn't like the fact that Star Wars, the, that the movie Star Wars is so, like it costs only six bucks on Hulu. And they want to be able to check, to edit the price of specific movies on the Hulu platform so what they do, they use a B2B API in order to set the price of the movie. Again, this is not type of an API that should be exposed to, reg to regular users, regular clients, only to partners that should be able to access this type of APIs. Now let's talk about the most common types of APIs, which is B2C APIs. And when you talk about B2C APIs, there is not only one type. IoT can be B2C, uh, web and mobile, they're all B2C APIs. And the way that I like to talk about APIs, every time I give an example, I like to, uh, to mention like very modern concepts, so very modern types of applications. In this case, we are talking about a ride sharing app, like Lyft or Uber. So let's talk about Lyft. There is mobile API, web API, and IoT API. If you take a ride on Lyft uh, and you want to book a specific ride, let's say that you want to uh, take a ride from San Francisco to Palo Alto, what you do is you click book ride and your mobile application doesn't communicate directly with the mobile application of the driver because there are many drivers and someone needs to manage this type of communication. So your mobile client would communicate with the mobile API of Lyft and it would ask for to book a ride. In this case, by the way, it's gonna be a post HTTP method. So this is one type of API that is used by the mobile clients. And then I'm not sure if you, if you know about it, but Lyft, they have a special framework. If you, if you have a business, you can manage all of your employees on Lyft. Like, so for example, if your employees use Lyft for business uh, trips, you can, there is a special platform for you to manage it. The thing is that Lyft doesn't have a, a mobile client for this type of platform. You, you need to, to use like a laptop with a browser. So it's basically a website. In this case, um, like you can see on the screen that there is some website that allows you to manage all of your, uh, of all of your uh, employees like as a business customer of Lyft. And it's done using a browser. So behind the scenes, because it's a modern web application, your JavaScript on the client, on your browser, would communicate with the web API of Lyft, which is only exposed to other businesses. Um, let's talk about the, the last, the third type of B2C APIs. So I'm not sure if you know it, 
Lyft and Uber, they started uh, having those e-scooters. So you, you can take an e-scooter or like an e-bike and just ride it around the city. People might have different opinions about e-scooters. I personally think this is the, the most fun thing in the world. Some people might think it's very annoying, but uh, let's talk about the e-scooters. Like if you use Uber to take a ride on an e-scooter, you always see the location of the scooter on the app. How can it happen? How can it happen? So the e-scooter has a GPS inside it with a computer, some simple type of computer. So it knows to communicate with the GPS and to know what is the location of the e-scooter. But it's done locally on the e-scooter itself. The e-scooter needs to update the lift. Uh, the e-scooter needs to update the lift platform. What is the location? What is the current location of the of the scooter? Otherwise, people can steal it. Uh, and it would be very hard to manage all the e-scooters. So what happens? The e-scooter uses the IoT API. If you think about it, e-scooter is an IoT uh, device, and it communicates with the IoT API of Lyft. Let's talk about internal APIs. So today we have concepts like Kubernetes and microservices. If we talk about Kubernetes, all the management and all the things that uh, happen behind the scenes of Kubernetes are done using REST APIs. All the internal communication in Kubernetes is using REST APIs. And if we talk about microservices, today there is a very big shift between monolithic apps into microservices apps. And instead of one component, you have many different microservices and these microservices need to communicate between them. This communication between uh, microservice one to microservice two is usually done using REST APIs. Um, one very important aspect about APIs is to understand it's not just a new buzzword that people like to use. API, uh, you need to understand that modern concepts are driven by APIs. Those are the building rocks. APIs are the building rocks of concepts like cloud, microservices, mobile, IoT, and Kubernetes. And that's why API security is so important. And today we can see in many cases that attackers choose to target APIs. Uh, and it's a very interesting question to ask why. Why attackers like APIs so much? I think that the main reasons today why APIs became such uh, an attractive target for, uh, for pen testers, for attackers, is because of three main reasons. First of all, APIs expose a larger attack surface. What does it mean? As a pen tester, as an attacker, every time you find an entry point, like a way to trigger a function on the server, it's a new attack, a new potential attack vector. And every time you have an option to send a parameter to, the, to, the, to, to a new entry point, it's a new place that you potentially can, can, can inject something, can manipulate the input, and to cause some type of vulnerability. The thing about APIs, they expose many, many, many endpoints and parameters because you have many types of APIs, as we talked about. Companies expose B2B APIs, B2C APIs, IoT APIs, and internal APIs, which is something possible to access them. Uh, and if we compare it to other technologies, like if we talk about monolithic applications or uh, multi-page applications, they usually expose less entry points. Uh, let's talk about some, for example, if you wanted to access a website, you would access get slash home dot ASPX and the, the server, the backend would return a visual page, an HTML page with all the details inside. Inside the HTML, you can find uh, your last uh, notifications, the list of the, uh, of the top users on the website, uh, the, the newest article and so on and, and, and so on. But this is one one entry point, you call for this uh, home.aspx and the response contains all the details together. In uh, single page applications, in APIs, it's very different. Uh, APIs expose more entry points. Instead of getting one, one complete HTML page, you would need to access get notification and uh, get top users and get articles and so on. So there are more entry points. The second point is APIs are oversharing. Many times you can see that developers tend to return full objects from the APIs. 
they would return a JSON that contains a bunch of details about the users and about other users without thinking so much who is the consumer of the data. Why does it happen? Because APIs are generic. One API endpoint can be used by multiple components. And many times, one API endpoint, for example, get users, it can be used by admins, it can be used by users, it can be used by the IoT, by the mobile, and the, by the web. So what happens is because of one endpoint can be consumed by different components, developers tend to develop more generic API endpoints and to return more details. So they don't need to change the API uh, in the future. The second point about this oversharing part is that if you take a look at the traffic between client and APIs, it's very easy to understand how the, basically how the application is written. As an attacker, if you're a good pen tester, one thing that you want to do uh, from like your pen testing perspective, uh, if you don't have the code of the app, you want to understand how the code looks like, how the different, uh, basically what is the structure of the code, and it allows you to understand better the application and possibly to find more interesting exploits. APIs help you as an attacker to understand better the underlying implementation of the app. And the last point is APIs are predictable. There is a very structured way because of the API economy and the REST standard, they encourage developers to develop APIs in a very generic and predictable way. So many times you can just change the HP method from let's say get to delete and you found another API endpoint just because this is a structure of APIs. Let's talk about a few recent API breaches. The first one is Uber. Uh, the researcher Anand Prakash uh, from AppSeq found this breach and it allowed full account takeover. It was a very interesting breach. It was a uh, IDOR or BOLA, broken object level authorization. It allowed Anand to take full control on all of the users in Uber, including drivers and riders. And this API was an oversharing API. Instead of returning just uh, basic details about the user, like uh, last name and, and first name, it returned the authentication token of the user. And then the researcher could use this authentication token in order to, uh, to log in on behalf of the user. Same thing about the famous Facebook breach. I'm not sure if you heard about it, but it was a combination of the view as feature and some, uh, I think it was the combination of another feature, another vulnerable feature of uh, something with videos. And it was the same problem. The Facebook API exposed the authentication token of the other users because APIs are oversharing by design. Many times you can see oversharing APIs. The last example I want to talk about it, it's in Shopify. Someone found an admin function that allows you to assign yourself as a shop manager. Uh, it was a bug bounty. It, I think uh, it gave the researcher about uh, $20,000, which is, uh, I think it's a nice amount of money. And the reason why the attacker was able to find this admin endpoint is because APIs are predictable. He managed to, to guess what is, the, uh, what is the URL of the admin endpoint. It's much easier to guess admin endpoint when it, come, when it comes to APIs because REST APIs are more generic and structured. Before I keep talking about API security, uh, do you guys have any questions? One of the questions that we had, uh, if we're going to get into OWASP top 10 API security, and um, I briefly hinted about that, that we will have upcoming sessions on that. And um, I, unless you want to add anything to it, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give a few examples for the OWASP top 10 for APIs. I'm not going to talk about each, uh, each one of them, just like a few, a few examples. All righty, let's, uh, let's keep going. Awesome. Um, so I want to talk about API threats and why API threats are different than uh, traditional threats. Because you can see many lists that uh, address web application uh, vulnerabilities, for example, the OWASP top 10 for 2017. And what I found is those threats become less relevant and less prevalent in modern applications. 
And I wanted to tell you a quick story about myself and how I got into the field of API security. I started my career back in Israel. I was part of the red team of the Israeli army and I used to break into many systems, mostly in the field of uh, financial, government, and military systems. And as you can imagine, those systems are based on traditional technologies, ASPX, .NET, SAP. And I used to find very traditional uh, vulnerabilities like cross scripting, SQL injection. This is how I used to break into systems. After five years in the Israeli army, I decided to buy a one-way ticket to California and they moved to the Silicon Valley, as you can see behind me, this is San Francisco, uh, to start a new, a new episode in my career. Um, and for the last three years, I've been working mostly with startups and tier one companies. And I got exposed to a new field of technologies, Ruby on Rails, Elixir, uh, Node.js. I, I wasn't very familiar with these technologies and very modern concept like uh, uh, single page applications, cloud environments. And the most important part that APIs are the main component is the building rock of these applications. The next thing that I found is that it's not very easy to find SQL injection and cross site scripting and CSRF and XXC in modern API based applications. I had to change my mindset in order to stay relevant in the industry. I didn't want to fly back to Israel. I kind of enjoyed San Francisco. So I had to adapt myself and to find new ways to hack into APIs. And that's what led me to join Erezi alone. He's the original leader, original leader of the OWASP API project. He is the director of research in Checkmarks. And we started working about the OWASP top 10 for APIs. The goal is this of this project is very simple. We want to address the new API threats that are relevant to modern applications. Instead of uh, talking about injections and stuff, which is kind of hard to find in modern applications, we, want, we wanted to, to put in one list all the modern vulnerabilities. And today, most of the OS top 10 are focused on authorization, authentication, and business logic abuse. Uh, I want to give you a few examples for, uh, for a few vulnerabilities from the OS top 10 for APIs. Uh, just as a quick introduction, we are gonna uh, talk more, like in more, with more details in the next uh, webinar. Let's talk about broken object level authorization, BOLA. Some people know this vulnerability is idle, which is insecure direct object reference. We decided to change the name because of uh, many reasons. You can read my article about BOLA to, to get more details, but let's, let's try to understand what is BOLA. Uh, first of all, before I start talking about details, I want to say that BOLA is the new SQL injection. If I knew how to exploit SQL injection like 10 years ago, I could potentially probably hack almost every website on the internet. Today, it's the same thing with BOLA. I don't think I've seen APIs that are not vulnerable to BOLA. Every time I test an uh, application, they are the application is vulnerable to BOLA. It's a very hard, vulnerability to, to protect against. And what happens in BOLA? I want to give you another example from some type of ride sharing app. So let's say that you are a rider in the Uber app and you took, you took a ride and now you want to get the receipt of the ride uh, in order to, to use Expensify and to get money back from the, from the company. So you click on the get receipt button on the Uber uh, mobile application and behind the scenes, there is an API call to get slash receipts. The, in this case, the receipts is the resource and then the ID of the specific object that you want to access, which is number five. Number five represents the receipt of the ride that you, take, that you took. Um, what happens next is uh, the receipts API looks at this API call and says, okay, I need to, to get receipt number five from the database and give it back to the client. This is, this is fine, this is legit because you should have access to this receipt. But what happens if a malicious attacker tries to cause the same API call? Uh, get slash receipt slash five. In many cases, the developers on the backend, they don't verify, they don't check, they don't perform authorization or access control. It's the same thing, checks, to make sure that receipt number five belongs to the logged in user. Uh, and this is where BOLA happens. 
and to be honest, it's not easy to, to develop and to kind of plan a decent authorization mechanism. Because in modern applications, there are many weird cases. Let's say that you take a, a ride on Uber and you decide to split, your pay, to split the payment with another friend that you invited to the ride. In this case, one receipt should be, should be shared between among different users, between two users. So many times those policies are not easy to define and uh, many times developers fail in developing good authorization mechanism and it leads to BOLA, where attackers can basically access sensitive objects of other users. In this case, the object, the broken object level authorization is about the receipt resource and the object is a specific receipt. Uh, and you can imagine what is the what damage this type this type of vulnerability can cause, because an attacker can easily write a script to enumerate all the receipts from number one to number one billion, and to get all the receipts of all the users in the Uber app. And receipts contain very sensitive information like PII, for example, the the address, um, the payment information. You don't want to have it in your APIs. Uh, the second vulnerability, it's broken function level authorization, which is BAFLA. This is another authorization issue. It's a case where an API exposes a few different APIs, and each one of these APIs should be accessed by a different group or by a different role. Um, so let's say that you have admin APIs should be accessed only by admins, driver APIs should be accessed only by APIs, and the same, uh, only by drivers, and the rider APIs. So you, you have an admin on the app and he, he wants to export all users to a CSV file. The API, the admin API exposes an endpoint of get slash admin slash export all users. And the response contains all the users on the app. This is a legit API call. Why? Because the admin should be able to perform this type of action. But what happens if the attacker sends the same exact API call? of get slash admin slash export all users. In this case, the API, uh, I mean, in this case, in many cases, developers don't validate that the user that try to perform this API call actually belong to the admin group. And if the developers don't validate on the backend that the, the calling user is from the right group, it's vulnerable to broken function level authorization. It's not the same thing as BOLA, because here we are not talking about a specific object, we are talking about a specific function. You shouldn't be able to access this function because you don't have the right privileges. Uh, the last, last uh, vulnerability I want to talk about is improper assets, asset management. It's very common in APIs and it has two main aspects. It's more like a housekeeping uh, type of vulnerability, lack of uh, housekeeping. So, the first type of uh, improper asset management is API endpoints with no documentation. So let's say that you have one service, one microservices, one microservice that exposes three different endpoints. One of them is get user, the second one is update location, uh, and, uh, and those endpoints, are you can find them inside the documentation. The developers know exactly about these endpoints, they know what parameters they should uh, receive and what is the data that, what is the output of this endpoint. Why? Because en those endpoints are documented. It can be in code, it can be in a Swagger file, but then you can find the third endpoint, the v0 slash b2b old slash export all users. It sounds kind of sketchy, but more, more scary than that, just the name, it's, nobody knows about this endpoint. This is called like shadow API endpoints. And this is more the responsibility of the developers to make sure that all the API endpoints are documented. Because if you think about that, when you expose an API endpoint, you expose something from your, your organization to the world. And this is great. This is the modern economy. You want to share details with mobile clients, with other partners, but you need to make sure that you know exactly where are all the things that you exposed. The second type of improper asset management is unknown API hosts. So, I think this problem became kind of big because of one main reason, it's too easy to do DevOps. Back in the day, if you wanted to spin up a new server, a new machine, it could take some time. Today, it's just two clicks on the AWS console 
and you can spin up a new API, a new environment, a new host, and it became way too easy to do it. So in many cases, in many companies, you can find something like QA-3-old uh, dot the name of the company dot com, and you you ask the developers or the DevOps engineers what what the heck is this specific uh, host or what is this environment, and they would tell you, I'm not sure. Uh, it it was here before before I joined the company, and I'm too scared to uh, to change it or to remove it. Uh, this is very dangerous, and you can see in many cases it leads to something that's called shadow APIs. Uh, that basically people don't know what assets they have in their environment. Um, so th that was just a small taste from the API project. And in the next webinar, I'm going to uh, give more details about each one of the top 10 for the APIs. Uh, in the meanwhile, I can ask you to join us to the OSP API security project. We have many exciting things going on. We are planning to publish uh, a few cheat sheets soon and also a vulnerable API so you can practice the OWASP top 10 for APIs. I'm going to move it to Victor from here. Thank you, awesome. guys. Yeah, um, you know, we have two questions. First is why put method is implemented. Put method is considered to be an insecure HTTP method. Um, I think in many cases you can see companies that use put method, it's a part of the standard of uh, HTTP. I don't think, I, I haven't had it considered to be insecure. If you want to send me a link or uh, to share more details why put method is considered to be insecure, uh, I would love to hear that. And maybe I can- The question is about BOLA. Is BOLA the same as authorization bypass? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, so about, about BOLA and about in general, authorization problems. Uh, authorization problems, it's a very generic name. You can, many things can be considered as authorization bypass. Uh, the reason we decided to split it into different categories is because uh, BOLA is very critical and you can put it together with other things in the same category. Um, so, Yes, the answer is yes. You can you could consider BOLA as authorization bypass, but it's a very generic name. It's the same thing that if you have cross-site scripting, you don't call it injection. You want to separate injections from cross-site scripting. Awesome. I know we have two minutes left, so I will be quick and brief. For all the attendees, if you guys are gonna be in LA or Beverly Hills area on February 19th. We have a free coupon code that you can use to attend our next conference on February 19th. If you go to futurecon.virtuallytesting.com, the regular price is $250, but if you use the promo code FUTUREBT20, that'll bring down the price to zero. So it's free for you guys. In March, we're gonna have a webinar on IoT security and also OWASP ASVS. In April, we're gonna have three and a half hour training on cloud penetration testing. For that, if you would like to join, you can go to this link on the screen. It will be also posted on our LinkedIn and uh, Twitter. As I mentioned in the beginning of this webinar, all of these slides and recording will be posted on our social media platform. If you would like to follow us, the links are on the screen, linkedin.virtualtesting.com twitter.versitytesting.com or youtube.versitytesting.com. With that, I would like to thank Enan. Thank you all the attendees. Thanks so much. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, guys.